Emmy's light footsteps were unheard by Mrs. Jessel, probably on account of the creaking noise made by her own. Had the form before her been that of Susan, Miss Trevor would at once have addressed her, but she had a dislike to entering in the darkness into a conversation with a woman who had told her so many ghost stories. Emmy therefore delayed speaking to Jail until they should both have entered a lighted apartment. The top of the flight of some stone steps was soon reached. Mrs. Jessel turned the handle of a door, and on her opening it, a light streamed from within, casting its yellow reflection on the wall by the staircase. Jail entered the room before her, and Emmy heard her say, What? At work still? as she passed into the warmth and light. Not in the least degree doubting that the woman had addressed one of the household, and eager to find herself once more amongst familiar faces, out of the darkness and chilly night air, Emmy quickly followed Mrs. Jessel into the room. No sooner had she crossed the threshold than she stopped short in surprise and alarm, gazing in motionless terror at the unexpected sight which met her eyes, for Emmy stood in the haunted chamber. Hello, this is Dr. Dan Renshaw from uh, the Department of History. And this is Dr. Andrew Mangum from the Department of English Literature. My research involves looking at migration to Britain in the 19th and 20th century and popular discourse surrounding migration. And my research is on the links between literature and medicine, and in particular the links between popular literature, the Gothic novel, and the history of medicine. And we're here tonight to discuss Gothic literature in the 19th century, some of which is held in the special collections at Reading University. So we're starting our chat tonight looking at The Haunted Room by Charlotte Maria Tucker, better known as A Lady of England, her pen name, uh, of which special collections have a beautiful 1894 edition available uh, for perusal, mm -hmm. I believe, or to look at. Andrew, what's The Haunted Room about? The Haunted Room, the title is a bit of a bit misnomer because it's not actually about a haunted room. It has all of those gothic mechanisms setting up a story, a ghost story, about a haunted room. But what it actually ends up being about is crime. Mm. And it's a very evangelical text full of uh, proper thought and the way in which we should be thinking about crime and wrongdoing. And it ends up being a testament to the strong will of the heroine against uh, criminal behaviour. And in that sense, it has its roots very much in traditional Gothic texts like Anne Radcliffe's The Mysteries of Udolpho, which is a massive influence, clearly, on this text. Mm. Especially on the character of Emmy. Yes, which uh, is only a veiled reference to Emily in The Mysteries of Udolpho. The Haunted Room involves uh, the central characters inheriting a massive estate from a dead aunt, and it turns out one of the rooms is haunted <laughs> and bricked up, and nobody is allowed to go in, and it's a, a, a codicil in the will that uh, nobody's allowed to go into one into this room. And it turns out that the housekeeper of the house and her husband are actually using that room to forge banknotes. Emmy, the main character, finds this out in the middle of the text, and she becomes the dupe of these criminal characters. She becomes uh, a very frail and very feminine character, but also with a lot of strength and a lot of reserve, which is absolutely a, a trait of the traditional Gothic novel. We should have added a spoiler alert in, in case you're going to, to read this. But, so, but we also have the two brothers, Bruce and Vibert. Yes. I would suggest competing with each other for insufferability. Yes, yes. This is very much an evangelical text, and so it is full of characters who end up being either strong-willed in a way that the text doesn't approve of, in the case of Vibert, or so heroic and so good that he's absolutely unpalatable to modern <laughs> tests uh, because he is so good, and that's the case of Bruce, both of which are a bit of a foil for the heroine, at points in the text, one through his heroism which gets him into trouble with the, the criminals in the text and the other one because he is duped and enlisted by the criminals in the text. Do you want to tell us a bit more about Charlotte Maria Tucker, her background? Yeah, she's actually a very interesting character. So um, she is the daughter of the chairman of the East India Company, which was a company who oversaw 
the trade relations between England and India and actually controlled the trade taking place over the Indian Ocean. And it was very much a colonial venture of which her, uh, her father was chairman twice. He was elected to that role. And Charlotte Tucker herself became a missionary in 1875. In fact, The Haunted Room is written on the eve of her departing mm-hmm. for India. And she never comes back to England, actually. She leaves at the age of 54 and she teaches Christian beliefs in uh, Indian schools to people who are native to India until her death in 1893. She's a very interesting character in in the sense of what she says about colonial movement and and colonial impressions and their influence on literature at that time. And while The Haunted Room isn't itself any great text to read within the context of of British colonialism, I think the author's story is, is fascinating from that context. And the Gothic in particular has a lot of intersections with sort of pictures of the East and movement, imperial movements and so on. And I think that's something that your research has, has picked up on. Yes, uh, I'm sort of particularly interested in the interplay between the Gothic and the other, which is often in a colonial context. The Mark of the Beast by Richard Kipling, uh, which interestingly has a reference to hydrophobia, just as uh, The Haunted Room does, and how the other appears. So the other as migrant, possibly, in Dracula, Uh, The other as the urban proletariat in Frankenstein. uh, The sexual other in Camilla. I was struggling to identify an other in the haunted room, though. Is there anyone we could put in that category, do you think? Well, there's the old lady who who dies because she she foolishly follows a quack remedy instead of the tried-and-trusted medicine of the town she lives nearby. And that ultimately leads leads to her dying. And I think it's a very critical text, actually, on the working classes. Mm. It's interestingly not at all empathetic towards the working classes who are on the estate of this enormous hall with the haunted room. And I think another interesting underclass is the criminal one. Uh, There's a character who is the main criminal in the text, who is very observable as a criminal character from the start. There's a very duplicitous aristocratic rake, but the main criminal activities are are very observable in that very Lombroso kind of, you can identify the stamp of criminality upon somebody's features. And those ways of thinking were very much transferable at the time from criminals to the working classes, but also people from other nations, from less developed nations. And that brings us to reverse colonisation. Yeah. Um, a massive Gothic theme, which is absolutely the driving force of Dracula. Yes. Who do we think a lady of England was aiming this story at? Who would the readership for this story be, I think? Almost certainly it would have been the middle classes. It would have been the middle classes which had grown enormously in the 19th century and had sort of divisions within itself. So prior to this, we have a very firm demarcation between the workers, the proletariat, um, the bourgeoisie and the aristocrats. But in the 19th century, the middle class opens up massively. So we have a lower working, a lower middle class, and we have a, a middle middle class, and we have a, a slightly more well-to-do. And it's clear that the haunted room is being aimed, I would say, primarily to young women mm. of the lower middle class. So it's very much, uh, it, it, the way in which it talks about the working classes implies it sees those as a different species and not the readership. But the way in which it tries to instill good evangelical beliefs into young women through the narrative of its heroine shows that it's aimed very much at a sort of general readership of the middle class. The term that was always coming to my mind was uplifting. Yes. All the time. And I thought that was an interesting shift from the popular fiction of, say, the 1850s, uh, 1840s, Barney the Vampire, Sweeney Todd, where it's quite straight up blood gut sex this is entertainment and with this with a lady of england it's very much it seems to be uplifting moral content 
Yeah, and it's sort of getting under the radar, I think. I think it's having this title, The Haunted Room, which a lot of people would pick up thinking they're going to have a nice pot boiler, they're going to have a nice bit of ghost story yarn to get through of an evening. <laughs> and what they actually find is a bit of a homily on the virtues of behaving yourself. And that wasn't uncommon, actually, towards the end of the 19th century in particular. Uh, there's a story by Florence Marriott called The Blood of the Vampire, which is actually about a bit of an immoral woman who drains the resources of, of all the men she comes into contact with. She's not an actual vampire, but you can see that title is absolutely a way of selling um, her text. But I think you're right that by the time the, the 19th century progressed into the later stages, those, so those um, early Penny Dreadful literatures by Reynolds and co., uh, get converted into narratives that have a bit of a polemic mission. And we can see that in, in texts like this that use the Gothic as a way of doing something else, as a way of lending itself to that period and, and the major issues that need tackling. One thing I thought was interesting, as someone who is unfamiliar to this author and her, her work, Comparing it to Dracula, which is written 20-odd years later, how, in some ways, the character of Mina Harker, Mina Murray, Mina Harker, in Dracula is very is similar to Emmy, but in other respects, how much more confident she is, how much more able she is, that she's an active protagonist. So I thought that was one interesting shift that takes place after uh, Tucker is writing. Yes, and Mina Harker is a much more interesting character, I mm. think, in that she, at the end, she becomes part of the, the team of light, as they call themselves, and she, she's holding a gun towards the end, and she's very much with the men fighting Dracula. I couldn't imagine that happening in The Haunted Emmy. Room to Emmy. In fact, there's a bit where she finds her brother tied up in a cottage that is being burnt down as a way of killing him. And the text describes her undoing the knot with which he's tied and her frail little feminine fingers are unable to, to undo the knot. And you, you just wouldn't yes. get that with no. Mina Hacker, who is a much more resolved character. She, she edits the text, she writes a lot of it, and she is absolutely in command of new technologies. And she's still very much in a subservient role in relation to her husband. Mm. And I think that's probably to our sort of 21st century sentiments a bit annoying. But nonetheless, she's a much easier character to admire than mm. Emmy, who is, I think, lifted straight from Anne Radcliffe 70 years prior and is feeling a bit dated by 1874. Yes, Mina Harker would have just grabbed Quincy Morris's bowie knife and mm. chopped the cords off, wouldn't she? Absolutely, she would have She would have dealt with that knot in no time whatsoever. <laughs> So thinking more broadly about where The Haunted Room fits in with the corpus of, of Gothic literature over the course of the 19th century, I thought you could perhaps divide Gothic literature into a number of different, I don't know if categories is the right word, but ways in which the Gothic sort of manifests itself. You have uh, texts that are explicitly supernatural, like Dracula, or The Beetle by Richard Marsh. Uh, you have texts like Frankenstein, which are through human agency, something incredible and impossible is created. And perhaps we could add Jekyll and Hyde to that. And then you have what we could call proto-Scooby-Doo stories, where, where it's human agency under the guise of, of supernatural activity. Uh, like The Woman in White by Wilkie Collins. Where would you place The Haunted Room? The Haunted Room is definitely proto-Scooby-Doo. It's very much of the... Um, it was a, a favourite technique of Anne Radcliffe, which, as I said, this is very much um, drawing on, where it's sort of the janitor at the end of Scooby-Doo, <laughs> where you think you're being chased by a ghost through the whole cartoon, and then at the end, the ghost mask is taken off, it's the janitor... And he would have got away with it if it wasn't for those pesky kids. And um, this is what happens here, that we're, we're led into thinking that this is a haunted room and that this is a ghost story. But actually there's human agency behind it. 
and it very much belongs to that traditional Gothic school where ultimately the supernaturalism is demasked and we, we're given a much more rational explanation. And that sort of taking it into the 20th century, when you start to get Gothic portrayed on film, it makes me think of early American horror cinema, where invariably at the end, however improbable it was, the ghost or the vampire would turn out to be a villain, such as in this case. And it's, it's a while until you get explicitly supernatural, unashamedly supernatural characters. True. I think there's an, an important lesson there. When, when I was young, I remember having to walk through a graveyard on the way to school and going to my mum and saying, I, I'm really scared of this graveyard. I'm really worried, especially when the nights are drawing in and it's getting dark. And she said to me, Andrew, it's not the dead you have to worry about in this life, it's the living. And I think that's ultimately a lesson that we get from these stories, that um, when, when you get the demasking of the villain and you see actually it's just a guy in a mask and he's capable of criminal behaviour, that is ultimately the more gothic thing. That is the, the, the biggest danger we face, not a ghost or a goblin. Emmy had not thought of fear so long as she leaned on her brother's arm so long as the lively Vibert was close beside her. But his departure, so sudden, that she had no time to cry, Do not go! Before he was gone, awoke her dormant terrors. To find herself in utter solitude, standing on the snowy lawn beside the gloomy yews, within bowshot of a dwelling said to be haunted, whilst the very moon was suffering eclipse, was a position which might have tried stronger nerves than those of Emmy. All the horrible tales that she had heard on the night of her first arrival, the colonel's ghastly legends, Jael's stories of apparitions seen in that very house, which now dimly loomed before the eyes of the maiden, the dark hints of dangers thrown out by Harper, all rushed at once on the mind of the timid girl. She made a few quick steps in pursuit of Vibert, but he had vanished from her sight round the corner of the house. Emmy was afraid to skirt half of the spacious mansion alone, yet equally afraid to remain in such dreary solitude to await her brother's return. A breeze stirred the branches of neighbouring trees. Emmy started at the sound of the rustle. The tall bushes in their shrouds of snow began into her excited imagination to assume the form of spectres. Emmy almost fancied that they began to move towards her. And now, it is not imagination, a dark figure is slowly moving along the gravel path whitened by snow which divides the lawn on which Emmy is standing from that back part of Mist Court to which her gaze is directed. Emmy's first emotion is that of terror, her next is that of relief. She recognises the sound of a short dry cough which has nothing unearthly about it. By the faint light of the half-eclipsed moon, this is the outline of a familiar form, most unlike the shape in which a spectre might be supposed to appear. Emmy feels no longer alone. There is Mrs Jessel, coming at no unwanted hour, with baskets on arm, doubtless to carry away what may remain of the evening group.